Welcome to this next video on the Newton Coates integration techniques. By the end of this video, you will be able to calculate integral, integrals using either the midpoint or the trapezoidal method. So let's start with the midpoint method. And just as a reminder, the general case is if we want to integrate a function f of x, what we are geometrically calculating is the area underneath the curve. Now, in a prior video, we looked at the rectangle method. Now, the question is, can we improve on the rectangle approach itself and not directly going to a composite method, but improving the rectangle method directly? So I'm going to assume that the function f is monotonic in the interval a, b, just to demonstrate how we can improve this method. So in the rectangle method, we've used either the height for the rectangle at the function value at the left or the right edge of the integral. Um, so that would be either f of a or f of b. Um, but can we use something other than those two values for the height of the rectangle? So I want to still approximate the area by a rectangle, but not necessarily with the height of f of a or f of b. So we saw before that one of these, depending on what's monotonically increasing or decreasing, one of these rectangle techniques, f of a or f of b, will underpredict the area underneath the curve, and the other one will overpredict it. So how about using the point in the middle, right? the function value at the midpoint, so at a plus b over 2? Right? That should, if it's monotonically increasing, one is underpredicting, one is overpredicting, that should be a better approximation to the area underneath the curve. So then I would approximate the integral by the height of this rectangle, the function value at the midpoint, f at a plus b over 2, times the width of this rectangle, which is still b minus a. Now, that seems to be a better approximation, but how about going composite? So let me use again n subintervals to improve the overall method. So then the integral would be, well, the sum of all these areas underneath the subintervals. So that would be for the first subinterval, the height would be, if the subinterval goes from x1 to x2, the midpoint is x1 plus x2 over 2. So the height of the rectangle is the function value there, times the width, which is x2 minus x1. And then we move on to the second subinterval. The height that I'm going to take for the rectangle is at the midpoint. That would be f at x2 plus x3 divided by 2, and the width of this rectangle is x3 minus x2. And we keep on going. Let's look at the ith subinterval. The height that I'm going to use for the rectangle is the function value at the midpoint of the ith subinterval, so that is the function evaluated at xi plus xi plus 1 over 2. And the width of this rectangle is simply xi plus 1 minus xi. Okay, and then we keep on going until we hit the last subinterval, the nth subinterval. The height of the rectangle here is the midpoint of that last subinterval, so that would be the function evaluated at xn plus xn plus 1 divided by 2. And the width of this subinterval rectangle is simply xn plus 1 minus xn. Okay, let me write this in a compact manner. So if I look at these formulas here, each one of these terms right in here has an x1, then there's an x2, x3, all the way to xi until xn. So that looks like this is going to be a sum from i equal to 1 to n. And what am I summing over? Well, the ith subinterval. So f of xi plus xi plus 1 divided by 2 times xi plus 1 minus xi. Now, if all the subintervals have the same width, h, right, then I can simplify this a little bit. I can move that in front of the sum, so I have the sum here as before, sum over the function values evaluated at the midpoints of the subintervals, and I can move the xi plus 1 minus xi, which is equal to h, in front of the sum. I can factor it out. So that would be the composite midpoint method. Okay, now um, all the methods up till now were using a zeroth order polynomial. Zeroth order polynomial is just a constant, right? That meant that 
The area that I was approximating the area underneath the curve with was the area of a rectangle. So let's go further than that. Let's go from a zeroth polynomial to a first order polynomial. So what would that do to our integral? Well, in that case, if I approximate the function by a line, then the area underneath this line is made up out of still a rectangle area, but then also a triangular area, right? So the area of the rectangle here would be f of a times b minus a, but then I also have the area of this triangle, which is a half uh, base times height, so a half b minus a times f of b minus f of a. So the formal way to doing this is by approximating the function f of x by a first order polynomial, a linear function, and then formally integrating this following this Newton Coates idea. So let's do this, right? This is the function f of x that I'm going to integrate. And it's just a linear function, so I can use first order Lagrange functions for this. The f of a plus f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a, that's the slope times x minus a. That's the uh, formal line equation for this red portion there. Now let me integrate this analytically, right? It's just a linear function that's easy to integrate. So the integral from a to b of this entire function here, I'm just copying it over into the integral. So let me integrate f of a, that's a constant, so that's f of a times x. Let me integrate this one here just as a factor out there, and then I'm integrating x minus a. That would be just a half that I pull in front times x minus a squared. Okay, and now I have to do, evaluate this between the bounds of a and b. So let's do this. So it's f of a times these bounds, so b minus a, plus a one half f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a, that remains the same. And then I have x minus a squared that I have to evaluate in the bounds of a to b. So that's b minus a squared minus a minus a squared. Okay, so a minus a squared, that is zero, so that drops out. And then I have a b minus a squared divided by a b minus a, so that b minus a in the numerator, the denominator cancels. And so what do I have left? Well, I have left one half f of b times b minus a, okay? And then I have this here from the b minus a at the front, which is f a times b minus a, but then I have to subtract another one half f of a b minus a. So one minus a half leaves me with one half f of a times b minus a. So that would be the integration formula using a first order polynomial to approximate the function and analytically integrating this function. And that's called the trapezoidal method. Now, how can I improve on this? Well, I can apply this formulas, formula to subintervals again. So let's do this on n subintervals. So I'm going to apply the formula to the first subinterval from x1 to x2. So that would be the integral from x1 to x2 of f of x dx, plus the integral for the second subinterval from x2 to x3. And I keep on going until I reach the ith subinterval. So that's the integral from xi to xi plus 1 of f of x dx, and so on until I hit the last subinterval. That would be the integral from xn to xn plus 1 of f of x dx. Okay, so let me introduce the sum symbol here, right? Because it's the sum of all of these subintervals, integrations. And so I have the sum from i equal to 1 to n. And then I'm going to do the integral of the ith subinterval. So the integral from xi to xi plus 1, f of x dx. That's my general composite integration formula. And now I am going to apply the trapezoidal method to each one of these subintervals, specifically the subinterval from xi to xi plus 1. Okay, so what is this ith subinterval? Using the trapezoidal method, that is simply 1 half the function at xi plus the function at xi plus 1 times the width xi plus 1 minus xi. So therefore, if I substitute this back in, I'm approximating the area underneath the curve by the sum from i equal 1 to n of this formula here for the ith subinterval. 
So a half f of xi plus f of xi plus 1 times xi plus 1 minus xi. OK, now, if all the subintervals have the same width, right? this formula up here so far is valid even if the data points that I have are not equally spaced. But if they are equally spaced, let me call the distance between adjacent points again h, I can simplify this to a half times f of xi plus f of xi plus 1, the sum from i equal to 1 to n, and I can move the xi plus 1 minus xi, which is equal to h in each one of the summation terms, I can factor that out. So it's a half h times the sum. All right, so if I write the formula like this, I will have to do two function evaluations per subinterval. Now, it's not always the case that the function evaluations are very quick and easy to do. Just assume that, for as an example, the function evaluation here, this f of x, would be the solution of a very complex system uh, that would take a very long time to evaluate. And in the formula that I have so far, I need two evaluations per subinterval. But if it's very costly to evaluate the function, I would be interested in a formula that minimizes the amount of function evaluations that I have to do. So let me see if I can minimize the number of function evaluations by just um, writing out the sum again. So I have a half h times, well, if i is equal to 1, I have f of 1, f of x1 plus f of x2. If i is equal to 2, I have plus f of x2 plus f of x3. If i is equal to 3, I have plus f of x3 plus f of x4, and so on and so on. If i is equal to n minus 1, if I approach the end here, so then I have plus f of xn minus 1 plus f of xn. And if I reach my last subinterval, i equal to n, I have plus f of xn plus f of xn plus 1. All right, so now let me combine these a little bit differently. So I have, first of all, 1 half times h times that first function value plus the very last function value. So it's a half h f of x1 plus f of xn plus 1. But then, well, I still have the 1 half h term. But then you see here that the f of x2 appears twice, right? So similarly, f of x3 appears twice. And in fact, the f of x4 appears twice as well. All of these inner function values appear twice in this sum, all the way to f of xn appearing twice. So instead of evaluating this twice and just summing it up, I can, of course, just write this as the sum of two times that function value. And those go from i equal to 2 to i equal to n. Now, if I look this here, the 2 cancels against the 1 half in front of this. So my final formula is a half h times f of x1. But x1 is the start of my integration a. So a half f of a plus f of xn plus 1, that is the end point b, so f of b, plus h times the sum of all the inner function values from i equal to 2 to n. Okay, so let's do an example here and let's integrate um, the following data here using the trapezoidal method. Okay, so here is my formula. And so all I have to do is that the integral underneath this is approximated by 1 half times h. So what's h? h is the spacing here between adjacent points. So that's 1, right? It's always 1, the spacing. So 1 half times 1 times f of a. So let's see here. f of a is this value here. That's my f of a. Then I have an f of b. That would be this one here. That would be my b and my f of b. So that would be f of a is 0 plus f of b is 100. Okay, let me just mark them. This is the 100. This is the yellow value. And then I have plus h, which is 1 times the sum from the second value 
to the nth value. Right, so let me just write here. So the i here, that's 1, 2, 3. This would be n plus 1, and this would be n. All right. So 1, all of these green values now, right, that's, that's these here, that need to be summed up. So that would be 1 plus 4 plus 9 plus 16 plus 25 plus 36 plus 49 plus 64 plus 81. So these are all the green values. All right, so if you uh, sum these all up, you'll find that this would be 335. Okay, um, that's the composite trapezoidal method. But uh, just out of interest, let's do the trapezoidal method, so without the composite one, for the entire integral and see what that would give us. So just the trapezoidal method soidal method without the composite part, so without splitting this into subintervals, would be this formula. Right? I of f is equal to one half times f of a plus f of b times b minus a. Okay, so let's just color this back in, f of a, right, and that's the a value. And then I had f of b, f of b, this is the b value. So that would be one half, f of a is zero, plus f of b is 100, times b minus a, 10 minus zero. So that would be one half of 1000, that would be 500. Now, those of you that, that paid close attention to what these values here are, right? Do you see that the f values are always x squared, right? So, and let me just look at here analytically, right? What I have here is f of x is equal to x squared. So analytically, right, the integral i of f is equal to one-third x cubed between 0 and 10, and that would be equal to 333.3 period. Right? That's the analytically exact answer. Um, but with my numerical methods, if I just use the, use the trapezoidal method over this entire integral here, I find 500, whereas the analytically exact answer would have been 333 and one-thirds. But you see that this composite trapezoidal method is not too far off, right? 335 versus the analytical answer of 333 and one-third. Okay, so now comments on coding. How would you code this particular function up here? Right, so this is the composite trapezoidal method. Um, it has a sum in here, right? It's the sum from two to n. Now, if the data values are stored in a vector, you can use the sum function in MATLAB to do this, right? You can have the sum of f, and now you have to say in parentheses the start index colon the end index over which you want to sum. So that would be here, if you look at this equation, I'm starting at i equal to 2 and I'm ending at n. So it's the sum of f parentheses 2 colon n. Or you can use a loop with a running sum, some sum variable s that you have to initialize as 0, and then you would do a for loop that runs from 2 to n and do a running sum. Thank you for watching.